Dyson Limited, game-changing origin and business model explained. Today, Sir James Dyson is worth about $14 billion. He's in the top 20 list of the wealthiest British people and in the top 500 globally. Almost all of it is thanks to his company Dyson Limited, which is renowned worldwide for premium quality vacuum cleaners. But four decades ago, Sir James Dyson was a struggling inventor who at some point had to visit local sawmills in the dark of the night to investigate the technology used there so that he can replicate it at a minute scale. And after inventing the most efficient vacuum cleaner of the time, he struggled to convince most of the major home appliance companies to license his designs. Almost all of them saw his invention as a threat to their existing business models. But before we find out how Sir James Dyson has managed to build Dyson Limited from an obscure entity to a leading brand, I have a request to make. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss any of the several videos we publish every week that explain the origin and business models of some of the biggest brands in the US and around the world. Now back to today's pick. Throughout the 70s, James Dyson, the British inventor and industrial designer, didn't have a reliable income. He'd been kicked out of the company he had helped found after disagreeing with other co-founders and investors about the future of the company. His former colleagues did not, in particular, understand his fascination with inventing better vacuum cleaners. They thought there were better equipped companies to innovate in that area. After leaving his first company, he was determined to prove them wrong. It was his mission to make a premium vacuum cleaner a reality through another company. It's essential to point out that his experience with the first company he founded must have informed a lot of his later business decisions, and in particular, how he has managed and grown Dyson Limited. For one, he seemed to have sworn always to maintain a 100% control over the company he would use to actualize his designs. For almost a decade, his young family relied on his wife's modest salary. She worked as an art teacher at a local school. Though not bringing home any checks, Dyson worked very hard. Under a shed behind their family house, he generated over 5,000 prototypes. He was quoted in a 2007 interview with Fast Company magazine, stating, I made 5,127 prototypes of my vacuum before I got it right. There were 5,126 failures, but I learned from each one. That's how I came up with a solution. So I don't mind failure. I've always thought that school children should be marked by the number of failures they've had. The child who tries strange things and experiences lots of failures to get there is probably more creative. And finally, he had a viable and revolutionary product for the market. He was able to design a vacuum that uses centrifugal separators to collect and separate debris from the air. Most vacuums on the market at the time had two primary weaknesses. One, they lost suck pull fast and second, they were easily clogged by dust particles. That meant that at times, one had to take quick successive breaks when cleaning to open up the system and unclog it. That was the case, especially when one vacuumed places with a lot of dirt. I must say, they were also not very nice looking. James Dyson had found a way to solve these two problems using a cyclone system. The technology had only been used in industrial settings as giant cyclone systems. Part of his research involved visiting a sawmill near his home at night to see how the technology was used. He was also trying to find out if it was possible to proportionally make the part smaller so that it works on a small appliance like a vacuum cleaner. In particular, it seemed impossible to apply the technology on smaller appliances such as vacuum cleaners because of the cost involved. Dyson was able to figure out how to do it and he invented ways to implement the system in vacuum cleaners. What's more, Dyson's vacuum did not need replaceable bags. After vacuuming, all one had to do was to empty the debris into the dustbin and go back to vacuuming. His design also looked a lot better than what was already in the market, and even today, aesthetics are a huge thing with Dyson vacuum cleaners. With his first prototype vacuum cleaner ready in the early 1980s, he went looking for licensees both in the UK and the US. Initially, he had little luck. Many of the manufacturers he approached turned him down. It turned out that the main reason they did that was that the new vacuum machine made vacuum bags useless. There was no need anymore for consumers to remain on a constant supply of the bags. 
At this time, vacuum bags were a $500 million worth market, complete with dedicated supply chains. The Dyson vacuum would render this industry obsolete, and major players were not ready for that. Interestingly, some of the manufacturers that turned Dyson's request down proceeded to use his designs without his permission. They manufactured vacuums with similar features to what Dyson had invented, perhaps hoping he wouldn't find out. But he did, and he did not take it lightly. Who would, especially after all that work that went into it? One of the companies that did this was Amway, an American company. Dyson sued them for patent infringement and an out-of-court settlement was reached. The first success with licensing to come Dyson's way was interest from a Japanese company. Apex Limited licensed Dyson's design in 1985 and a year later released the product into the Japanese market. In 1986, Dyson also licensed his designs to Phantom Technologies, a company serving the North American market. It's the money that James Dyson collected from these two companies for the licenses that he used to incorporate Dyson Appliances Limited in 1991. This is the company we know today as Dyson Limited, having shortened its name in 2001. When the Phantom Technologies contract expired in 2001, Dyson Limited entered North America. And the North American market has turned out to be the most lucrative for the company. Dyson has continued to have a recognition as a premium brand. What strategies have helped the company grow? Since its inception, Dyson has relied on two features that differentiate it from other products in the market. First is the ability of their machines to withstand long times of usage without losing sock power or getting clogged. In the early days, the company thought this was the most convincing selling point. However, a few years later, it realized the second feature was more resonating with potential buyers. And that brings us to that second feature the company has exploited to acquire more market share. That is the lack of a need by the consumer to use replaceable vacuum bags. When the company decided to exploit this as the main selling point in their ads, they saw a significant increase in sales and market share. Today, Dyson Limited manufactures more than just vacuum machines. The company has since expanded to produce other electronic appliances, including hand dryers, hair dryers and washing machines. The company also manufactures air purifiers, bladeless fans and heaters. The company has also expanded its manufacturing capacity and expanded operations beyond the UK. And part of this has been to open more factories, including some in Malaysia, where the cost of manufacturing is lower. For very long, Dyson manufactured its vacuum cleaners and washing machines in Malmesbury, Wiltshire. In 2002, the company moved the manufacturing of these two products to Malaysia. The primary reason for the move was cutting costs. The company has disclosed that it managed to reduce production costs by 30% by moving some of its manufacturing to Malaysia. But the manufacturing in Malaysia is done by other entities on behalf of Dyson Limited. The company has signed contracts and partnerships with several local manufacturers, including Mayban Group Limited and electronics manufacturer VS Industry BHD or VSI. In January 2019, the company announced it was moving its headquarters to Singapore. The reason given was that Dyson Limited wanted to be closer to the world's fastest growing economies, meaning China and the entire Southeast Asia. But there was also mention of the restrictions that both the EU and UK bureaucracies impose on companies like Dyson Limited that want to innovate and create more interesting products for their consumers. In January 2019, the company announced that it was setting a team aside to design and develop a Dyson electric vehicle. Finally, everyone thought the era of thinking of Dyson as primarily a vacuum cleaner manufacturer was coming to an end. The team, as well as the factory meant to make a Dyson electric car a reality, was to be stationed in Singapore. Indeed, the idea of building a Dyson electric car seemed to have been a significant consideration for the company when deciding to move its headquarters to Singapore. Manufacturing an electric vehicle in Europe faces more restrictions from regulators than is the case in Singapore. But in October 2019, the company announced it was shelving the electric car project, and this was a shock to many given that it had been just a few months since the company announced it. The reason given is that the company realized it would be distracted from its core business operations. 
Others have, however, speculated that the most likely reason is that the company realised the competition was stiff and electric car sales were not growing as fast as earlier predicted. Whatever the reason, it's now clear that Dyson is going to remain a vacuum cleaner brand for the foreseeable future, primarily. How does the management structure of Dyson Limited look? As mentioned earlier, it seems like the experience that Sir James Dyson had with his first business has influenced a lot of the decisions he's made in regard to investment and management structure. Dyson Limited has remained a private company with 100% ownership by Sir James Dyson. This has to some extent worked well for the brand, given that decision making is not dragged through bureaucracy. It could also be argued that the brand could benefit from the input of more shareholders and diverse leadership styles. How long the current structure will remain is not clear. It's hard to tell whether Sir James Dyson plans to pass ownership to his three children or if there's a likelihood of the company going public. I thank you for sticking with me to this point. We really appreciate it. If you've not subscribed, please do, and don't forget to like, share and comment. We look forward to seeing you in our next video. Thanks. Bye-bye.